It is impossible to know exactly what happened, but we can piece together some things in an intelligent and logical fashion. Portland, Maine is known for its fishing industry, which has employed many generations. Pearl Smith worked packing fish at the docks. She worked long hours and made a low wage. Pearl was known to frequent the bar located at the South Portland Veterans of Foreign Wars, or VFW, post 832, the same idea as a legion in Canada. The VFW was near her work, where she would grab a beer and catch up with the other regulars at the bar after her shift. One of the other regulars at the bar was William A. Bruns, who went by Bill. He and Pearl met at the bar and soon found they had a common interest in drinking. Bill worked as a trucker for the fish industry, transporting fish from Maine to Montreal. Bill was 13 years older than Pearl. Pearl had been married five times before meeting Bill. Bill was recently divorced after his third marriage. In the summer of 1986, Pearl and Bill decided to get married. In August of 1991, Pearl's daughter grew concerned when she couldn't get in touch with her 48-year-old mother. Pearl had not attended a family gathering that she had planned to go to without informing anyone of her absence. On August 13, 1991, Pearl's daughter phoned police to report her missing. When investigators searched Pearl and Bill's residence, they noticed that all of Pearl's personal belongings were still at the house, including her black Cadillac, which she loved and would drive everywhere she went. It even had her name, Pearl B, on the license plate. Pearl's daughter thought it was odd the car was at home and Pearl was not. The car being left behind in the garage said to me that my mother never left the home. Um, if my mother had left the home, she would have been in the car. Bill told police that he and Pearl had an argument, so he left to get Chinese food, and then when he got home, Pearl was gone. He explained that Pearl would sometimes leave without telling him where she was going, and he wasn't worried when she didn't come back. Police were able to confirm that Pearl did sometimes leave for days at a time, usually up to a week, to stay with friends or family members, but she would usually pack some belongings and drive herself to her destination in her car. Police were able to confirm that Pearl had not taken a flight, bus, or taxi around the time she went missing. Bill also told police that Pearl probably ran off with another man, to which the police chief agreed was the most logical explanation at the time. According to Pearl's daughter, the police chief may have had his own reasons for coming to such conclusions. Chief Swartz did not believe that my mother was a missing person. He believed that she was a drunk who may have possibly ran off with another man. He knew my stepfather, Bill Bruns, personally, and he believed that Bill was not the type of person that would do anything to hurt anybody. And he had made such a statement to Christine Young, the reporter at one time. Reporter Christine Young recounted what the police chief had told her. He said, ah, she was an alcoholic. She'd been married six or seven times. She probably ran off with one of her ex-husbands. I said, well, what about her current husband? Could he be involved? He goes, nah. I've known him for 20 years, couldn't be him. This would be a good example of a conflict of interest. Pearl's suitcase was laying on her bed and appeared to be half packed with her belongings. What seemed odd to investigators was the trail of blood on top of the suitcase. It resembled high velocity impact spatter, the type of spatter that forms when someone is hit and the blood lands in a certain pattern, like throwing paint at a canvas. This was not the only blood pattern found on the suitcase, though as there had been low-velocity blood spatter and some of the blood had been smeared, 
it appeared that the high-velocity pattern came from the cast-off of the blood flinging off of an object, followed by any blood falling from the victim or the attacker leaving the low-velocity pattern. A struggle between the two could cause the smearing of the blood, or could be the result of a bad cleanup job. People who knew the couple said they were close. They would meet for lunch each day at Becky's diner on the docks near Pearl's work. In the days leading up to her disappearance, Pearl had been spending a lot more time at her favorite bar. As she drank, she said that she and Bill had been arguing over money and that she felt depressed. One of Pearl's friends recalls something Pearl had told her that seemed odd at the time. Said, there's one thing I want you to know. She said, if anything should ever happen to me, you tell them that Bill did it. And I said, Pearl, what are you talking about? And then I just forgot about it. As the months passed and Pearl's daughter didn't hear from her mother, she held out little hope of hearing from her. I knew that my mother would have been in contact with me, so there was no doubt in my mind that my mother was no longer alive. Um, my mother was the type of person that would have gone to great lengths just to be able to contact me or my daughter. On September 28, 1991, six weeks after Pearl was reported missing, a hiker stumbled upon a purse on the Appalachian Trail in New Hampshire. When they opened the purse, they found Pearl's identification along with some of her jewelry and money. It also had blood spatter on the outside. The strange coincidence of the purse being found in this location was that it was the same location where another woman was found murdered over a year before and her killer was never caught. A search of the area turned up nothing that would indicate what happened to Pearl, but investigators now believe that Pearl was no longer alive. Investigators decided to pay Bill another visit. When they entered the home, they noticed how fresh his living room carpet looked. I remarked to Bill Bruns, gee Bill, you've uh, got new carpet. And, and he denied that. He said, no, 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 this is, this is the same carpet. And I said, well, you, you've had the carpet cleaned. And he said, no, no, I didn't have it cleaned. He said, I just sprinkled it with this uh, rug refreshener and vacuumed it. And I was really astounded because it was sparkling clean. Neighbors told police they had noticed Bill struggling to get a carpet cleaner up on his porch and into the house. With the suspicion pointing in Bill's direction, Pearl's daughter was frustrated with Bill and decided to have a talk with him. I sat down with Bill one day at the kitchen table and I spoke with him and I told him, you know, Bill, you're the last one that saw my mother. You're the only one that would know what happened to her. And he just kind of sat there and looked at me and never said a word. Police decided to search Bill and Pearl's home using cadaver dogs. In order for the dogs to pick up the scent of dead tissue, handlers have the dogs smell a chemical called Sigma Pseudo Corpse Scent. If the dogs find a spot with a similar scent, they will lay down to indicate something is there. When the dog entered Bill's residence, it went straight for the basement. The dog circled the basement, then zeroed in on an area leading to a crawl space where it then laid down. Police began to dig in the spot in the basement, but they were unable to find anything. Since Bill was a trucker, it was speculated that he left Pearl's body somewhere along his route, or that he had thrown her body into the ocean. His truck was for hauling fish, so it was refrigerated. This could be a way for him to transport Pearl without anyone noticing. Investigators got a search warrant for Bill's house and sprayed luminol, a chemical that reacts to traces of blood invisible to the eye after an attempted cleanup. When luminol reacts to blood, it glows in the dark and shows the pattern of the blood, which are usually smears if the blood has been wiped up. When they sprayed the house, they found evidence of blood on the walls and floors, footprints on the carpet in the living room, and footprints leading to the bathroom. On the edge of each step leading down to the basement were smear marks glowing in the dark. A large blood stain was found on the basement floor. In a 38 by 25 foot crawl space, they found a blood pattern of a human body measuring the same height as Pearl. Bill continued to say he had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance. When the investigator asked Bill who he would suspect could cause harm to his wife, Bill replied, I would suspect the husband. Bill was asked to take a polygraph exam and he refused. One year after the search began, police had searched Bill's home a total of three times for Pearl and could not find her. They were convinced that she was still on the property and assumed she was in the basement. 
investigators became aware of a relatively new technology at the time called ground penetrating radar, which is used like a metal detector to indicate if there's an object underground. Within a month, on September 11th, 1992, investigators were back in the basement. The radar was used to scan the dirt floor of the basement. The printout from the radar showed a large spot that was inconsistent with the rest of the soil. Three feet underground, they found rust-colored sand. Next to it, they found a different type of inconsistency, where a large layer of dirt was missing, indicating an object was down there. Investigators began to dig just as Bill was arriving home from work. They were shocked when only two feet underground, the shovel hit a plastic bag. As they dug deeper, they unearthed a body wrapped in two large garbage bags tied with rope and tape. The body was badly decomposed, but was wearing a wristwatch with the name Pearl Bronze on it. The shoes had pink laces, which was the same color as Pearl's laces. Those present at the scene said the smell of Pearl's body was overwhelming. An autopsy of Pearl's body found she had been struck at least three times on the left side of her face. Since the skin on her face was not torn, it was assumed that a weapon was not used to inflict these injuries, but rather a fist. Around 6 p.m. on the day Pearl was found, Bill had just arrived home from work and was eating a plate of spaghetti when investigators went to tell him of their findings. You'll never guess what we found downstairs, the arresting officer said to Bill. I don't know, what? Bill asked in a cranky tone. We found Pearl. She's downstairs. Can you believe that? How did she get down there? I haven't the foggiest, but you know what? You're under arrest. For what? Murder, Bill. Murder? That's a pretty strong word. Bill, that's a pretty strong smell. Reporter Christine Young described the arrest. And the detective walks up to him and says, Bill, come on, we're going. And Bill says, why? He says, you're under arrest, Bill. And Brun says, for what? And he says, murder, Bill. Bill says, murder, that's a pretty strong word. And Pat goes, Bill, that's a pretty strong smell. Pearl's daughter described Bill's behavior during the arrest. When they unearthed the body, you know, you could smell the stench for miles. And he's upstairs in the house eating spaghetti. And when they come up to arrest him, he asked if he could finish his dinner before they took him away. So it just kind of shows, you know, what a sick individual he was. Bill was arrested and taken to the police station without finishing his spaghetti. Prosecutors thought it was strange that Bill had not called to report his wife missing since he would be the first to notice she was gone. They believed that on August 11, 1991, Bill and Pearl were having another argument about money to the point where Bill felt the need to punch Pearl in the face. It was believed that the blood spatter was created when Pearl's mouth and nose bled from the blows to her face. They believed that Pearl died while bleeding out on the floor. Bill then tried to cover up his crime by putting Pearl in the plastic bags, tying it with rope and tape, then dragging her to the basement. As Bill dug the grave, blood pooled out of the bags, creating the outline of Pearl's body that was visible with the luminol. It was assumed that Bill tried to throw investigators off his trail by throwing Pearl's purse on the hiking trail in New Hampshire. On April 3, 1994, Bill pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Bill's lawyer said he was indicted for murder, and today both sides agreed that the most likely outcome of the case was a manslaughter conviction, so the state agreed to dismiss the murder charge and he agreed to the manslaughter. Bill had been incarcerated at the Cumberland County Jail since he was arrested. Something else the autopsy found was that Pearl had terminal cancer and would have likely only lived another six months. Pearl's daughter had this to say about finding out her mother had cancer. If he had just been patient, my mother would have died of natural causes anyway, and he wouldn't be sitting in jail now. And uh, I just see it as my mother getting the last laugh on him because, like I said, she, if he had just been patient, she would have died on her own. Since he pled guilty, Bill could not appeal his conviction. Bill served his sentence and at age 87 in 2019, still lives in the South Portland, Maine area. 
Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Here's what's making news. Murder for hire. 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 The Valley woman arrested accused of trying to hire a hitman to get rid of a romantic rival. Investigators telling us she did this not once, but twice. At Maricopa County Jail, where an inmate told police that a friend of his named Alice Pleasanton was trying to hire a hitman. Now, police posed as that hit person, and they contacted Pleasanton, who said that she essentially wanted to have the girlfriend of a former lover of hers killed. Pleasanton is actually blind, and she admitted to police that she doesn't really know what this intended target even exactly looks like. Now, police said they would do this for about one to $2,000, but Pleasanton said that she expected it to be done for free. That is when police moved in and they arrested her at her apartment. Got up early in the morning, the squad team was out here. They're just, they surrounded the whole place, waiting until they got the warrant. And when they did, they went inside, got the woman. She is still in the Maricopa County Jail. At this point, the intended target has told police that she still fears for her life. Well, that's going to do it for all of us here. Thanks for listening. I want to give a special thanks to the family members and law enforcement officials who speak on behalf of the victims by sharing their stories. I think their voices should be heard, but I like to be discreet with their names for their own privacy. You can follow on Instagram or Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe.